So Shabir, can I start the talk now? So good morning to all of you. Uh, I thank you for the invite uh, to me in joining your uh, group for a talk on gadgetization of the human. Uh, especially uh, during one of the most unprecedented times in uh, human history. Uh, we are looking at the problem of the gadgetization of the human. So before embarking into uh, the details of my arguments, I wish to give you an introductory remark about, you know, stages um, of communication revolution uh, or stages uh, which have ultimately landed in gadgetization of the human. So when you look at the introduction of a technology, uh, the phases of development of the technology, uh, you can visualize, you know, three stages in the development of a technology. Uh, it is the introductory stage where the technology is introduced or a device is introduced to um, serve a particular purpose in that sense. While at that time, uh, the technology need not be accessible to all. The technology is a costly uh, mechanism. It is the engagement. The engagement in that technology is possible only in the case of governments or nation states. For example, when the computer technology was introduced, you know, it was not accessible to all. It was uh, restricted to only for the use of certain nation states for certain imperial purposes you know that and in the second stage you have the permeation stage the permeation stage is the stage in the in the in which this technology expands into a much more wider canvas not a bigger canvas but a much more wider canvas from the starting point that is the introductory stage now ultimately the technology reaches the power stage so you can classify the development of technology especially with relation to communication revolution uh, to which i am pinning my talk on gadgetization of the human that's why i'm taking only communication revolution as uh, the major concept uh, that is to be discussed in this forum so and uh, cybernetics, you know, or cyber philosophers have classified it into introductory stage, permeation stage, and power stage. In the first stage, that is the introduction stage, the earliest uh, implementation of the technology are esoteric um, or often regarded as intellectual curiosities or even as playthings more than usual tools in that sense. After all, it is a big story of uh, development of technology, it's something like an imaginative story. There is much fictional reality in the development of technology in that sense, you know. So initially, only a few people are aware of the technology, but some are fascinated by it and uh, therefore explore its capabilities in that sense. Gradually, the devices improve and operate effectively enough to accomplish certain definite goals. Assuming the technology is novel and complex, the cost in money, time and resources in using the technology will typically be high. Because of these limitations, the technology's integration into society will be minor or will be limited uh, and its impact on the society in that sense, you know, it's only to a very limited extent. Now, as I told you in the second stage, that is in the permeation stage, uh, the technological devices are standardized. Uh, the devices are, uh, uh, to a certain extent, um, they are more conventional in design and in operation, but its number of uses grow. A special training classes may be given to educate more people in the use of this technology. The cost of application drops and the development of technology begins to increase as the demand for its uses increases. 
But even in this stage that is in the permission stage, the use of technology will be moderate and its overall impact on society becomes noticeable as the technological devices are adopted more widely. And finally, you reach the third stage that is the power stage where the technology is firmly established, uh, the technology is easily available uh, and can be leveraged by building upon existing technological structures in that sense. So an expansion of the domain of the technology is there and most people in the culture, in the society are impacted directly or indirectly by the use of this technology. Now this technology, you know, it reaches, you know, um, a wider uh, terrain, uh, a large group of a majority of the people, you know, use this technology and many understand how to use it or to benefit from it. Economy of scale drives down the price and wide application provides pressure and incentives for improvements. So the impact of the technology on society is what marks it essentially as a revolutionary. What is its impact on a particular group of people or a large group of people? For example, you know that, you know, um, uh, technologies, technocrats invented toasters, bread toasters. But bread toasters, the use of bread toasters have not resulted in any revolution. And if you stop the working of toasters for one day, Nothing will happen in the world. I take toasters out of the society and not much is changed. But you look at the automobiles and the electricity. Remove automobiles and electricity and our society will come to a shutdown in that sense. So that is affected. This is the power stage of technology. So you know that computers were used initially by big empires, big national states to code and decode certain military signals, you know, for imperial purposes. And at that particular point of time, after the Second World War, you can see that these computers, the same computers were used by certain big banks, you know, very advanced universities, laboratories and scientific establishments and even some of the government departments. So that did not reach the people as a whole. But when you come to the use of computers, you will be able to see that, you know, from 1970s onwards, the computers or the information system got widened and it started reaching to a large uh, segment of the people where you can see that the technology passes from the introduction stage to the permeation stage, the permeation stage, where, you know, people are trained in the art of, you know, using computers. Uh, special courses or training sessions were given to people in order to know how the computer works and how you can work on the computer. And from up to 2000, up to 2000, you know, I am making certain periodic, you know, what you call uh, categorizations or phases just to uh, denote how the internet technology developed. Up to 2000, you know, it went like that in the permeation stage. But from 2000 onwards, cybernetics uh, or cyber philosophers, they argue that from 2000 onwards, it reached the power stage. Uh, take, for example, the mobile phone. The device that was invented by Alexander Graham Bell, that stationary phone, which is usually placed at the corner of a room. Even about that, Marshall McLuhan commented, a telephone is an irresistible intrusion into the privacy of time and space. So now what to think about the present telephone that is the mobile phone. It is an irresistible intrusion into the privacy of time and space. It has become one with you. It has become an essential, what you call, companion for you at all times. Especially when you look at from the point of view of, you know, the present in that sense. As a social scientist, uh, I wish to reflect on uh, the present and the expansion of the terrain of this technology, science and technology in that sense, you know. You look at the coronavirus period, you know. So several mutations are happening, like the mutations are happening in the virus. You know, mutations are also happening in the human bodies in that sense, you know. So this is a great post time for us. And people were using telephones and other apps to, uh, to get a relief in that sense from the particular pandemic fear 
that is spreading all over the world. So mobile phones or systems, information systems, have served the purpose of a rescuing technology in that sense. The wife and the husband, you know, they have to disable their domains. They can live happily inside a home using the same technology with certain borders in that sense. The domains are fixed by technology. They are comfortable with their mobile phone. See, uh, the leaders of the church, for example, the religious leaders, you know, uh, they can, uh, religious people can listen to gadgeted prayers in that sense, you know. You can bring your uh, faith mechanism into a particular uh, television or uh, a mobile phone. So you can uh, have uh, certain spiritualistic solaces in that sense, you know. Students can access uh, instructors or the teachers through the internet. And the teachers see the students through the internet. Okay. So you can bring to your room the most recently released cinema. So when you are panic stricken, when you are not that pleasant and happy in a lockdown situation, technology started reaffirming its faith by making you relieved of the tensions and making you informed of the latest development, even developments that is happening with regard to the invention of the vaccine. All of us are looking forward to the invention of the vaccine in that sense. Okay. But you see, but almost all the people, all over the people, all over the world, you can see that, you know, people collectively look to a science and technology and scientific research that would lead to the discovery of a new vaccine. So a cure from pandemic, restoring the old happy moments, you know, is possible only with the effective implementation of technology in that sense, you know. It is a medical technology in that sense, you know, a lot of research is happening in that sense. So, the coronavirus, the period as of now, that is the lockdown period, taught you one thing, that personally you can be more pleasant, uh, you can retain your happy spaces with these technologies. At the same time, it also reinforced our belief in science and technology. So, two propositions I am placing before you. You are relying on the discoveries and inventions made by the scientific experiments and technological innovations which made you more comfortable and connected in the pandemic period which is not yet over this is the first proposition and the second proposition is that you are looking forward to seeing the triumph of science and technology i repeat you are looking forward to seeing the triumph of science and technology that would certainly bring happiness again for the human civilization. These are the two uh, propositions I am making before you. But, uh, you know, I need to elaborate on this with certain specific uh, instances uh, of the rescuing technology in that sense. Uh, now, we live in a world of new apps in that sense, you know. The apps have become very meaningful in your life. It is not the Malayala, Mal Malus connotation to app, you know, you are, uh, you know, causing harassment or uh, by causing harassment to a particular individual by using certain tricks, nasty tricks uh, that we use, you know, uh, the term, uh, the Malus app in that sense. But the real app is the uh, software is developed by scientists and technologists. The technologists developed so many apps in that sense, you know, applications in that sense. Uh, umpteen number of apps are being uh, downloaded into your telephones these days. Why? In order to surmount the difficulties posed by the COVID times, the most disastrous times that we have witnessed, the times of confinement that we are undergoing. So, you just look for an example, you know, I am taking one up in that sense and to showcase before you uh, some of the structural changes in the mindset of the people. This is not, not for generalizing, but to show you a case where an important app, how it saves in a certain com consumers in that sense, you know. For example, it's, a, it's not a funny thing to look at the BoQ, you know, the, the, uh, the app that was developed by uh, a software company, which got the license from Google, uh, which is called the BoQ. So look at the app. Now, you look at the consumers as such, you know, people who were deceased of taking certain uh, intoxicants, you know, or alcoholic beverages. So they were frustrated. They were so much disillusioned in that sense. No philosophy was able to cure them or to uh, to give them some relief in that sense, you know. 
So now all on a sudden the up is emerging. So at this point of time you have to bear in mind that this up is actually the up is getting license from the new god as philosophers and historians say the new god that is Google. So now the relief for the particular consumers of you know this kind of uh, spirited uh, drinks and beverages comes from the Google. So now the people who enjoy these kind of drinks, you know, they go to the particular app, they download it and they order and they get the coupon or whatever token they uh, want to get to procure the drinks, you know, and they're very happy. So the frustration of a particular set or segment of consumers is resolved by the Google app. So now the Google become a cultural manifestation in itself. Because it brings a lot of relief for a class of customers who want a particular commodity. Here instance, in this instance it is the a particular scotch whiskey or a rum or wine, whatever be like that, you know. So anybody can order in that sense, you know. So in a micro level, the individual that is affected by the pandemic uh, because of his non-accessibility to a particular uh, commodity is so happy that using this app you can again reach the same commodity in that sense you know so you are very happy so individually it sold it resolved who resolved ultimately technology resolved right so what is my argument is that now now by relying on this particular app the application of the technology gets widened to a large group of people you know i don't i don't mean that you know all the you know uh, drunkards are illiterate people, you know. There are so many illiterate people, people, people living in the slums, you know, uh, people, uh, hawkers, vendors, you know, and all people, you know, some subset of, you know, what we call as the marginalized people in that sense, you know. They come to terms with the new app in that sense. I'm not saying that you, they are using it for the first time. So this app, you know, it resolves a present crisis and at the same time, my argument is that, I argue that, this will lead to an expansion in the belief of technology and tech gadgets, you know. So they will be using, the people will be using the same app or a different app for serving different purposes in that sense. Now, it is happy drinking again, happy people, uh, the issue of the drunkards are resolved. And now you see on a higher level, the governments are also happy. Because technology saved the financial crisis. It was a quite unprecedented financial crisis that the government faced. So now the government initiated with this kind of technology, it will soon start supporting such devices and apparatuses for, receive, for uh, resolving issues elsewhere. So the case that which I showcased is a simple case in order to make you understand the impact factor of the technology on a particular segment of people who were so frustrated in that sense, you know. Same time, the government is also very happy because the financial crisis, uh, that is the financial problem that is encountering, that is uh, resolved, that can be resolved through selling maximum uh, liquor. Now, look at the case of farmers who want to sell their products. New software technologies are being developed for, you know, the farmers for uh, giving them a platform to sell their products. Naturally, the farmer community also will be coming into this particular mechanism of the gadget. Now you look at the business people like the hotlers, the Amazon Prime or the Netflix which you know sell cinema. I saw yesterday's Hindu in the front page that it's a release of a new Tamil film where Jodhika acts you know as a heroine that will be released in Amazon Prime. So cinema too is coming online. Perhaps the coming of cinema in online you know may affect uh, a large segment of you know cinema uh, goers and you know people who entertain themselves by seeing cinema the large you know majority of the people belonging to uh, marginalized sections you know they may find it initially a difficult proposition but soon this will be easily spreading into their telephones also the app applications so that they can also use this so technology in that sense is a democrat in that sense technology is a slow democrat in that sense but it reaches all through technology, science in general becomes the most accepted tool. So technology is just the application of the scientific paradigm, you know. So what ultimately triumphs, you know, all the hearts of all these people 
is the belief in science and scientific rationality. Technology is just a manifestation of this science in that sense, you know. Now, you leave all these uh, areas and now you come to happy cooking times which you experience uh, in your hotel, in your, in, your, in your residences, in your homes. The internet has become a new cooking chef in that sense, you know. It reaches the kitchen. So now people rely on the internet, you know, the cooking or the culinary skills, you know, they are developing by looking at, you know, the cooking experiments of people, uh, experts through the internet. So you and your mobile phone become partners in kitchen. It has, uh, you know, it has, you know, uh, reached a particular scale. You can see that there is an internet revolution in the cooking spaces. Kitchen becoming a new laboratory in that sense, redefining culinary practices. So now, be the woman or the man or the child whose culinary skill is improved, naturally gets emotionally tied up with this machine in that sense. So new dishes are on the rise. New food culture, new dietary practices in some cases. Most often, people try to recreate certain popular items in you know, dishes in that sense, you know, for example, KFC, some people tried. Just to see, suppose a wife's name is Amina, and she uh, recreates KFC in her home by looking at the particular uh, demonstration of how to make a KFC chicken in that sense. And children and the husband, all of them are happy because in the COVID times, you know, it was really difficult for them to get the KFC. And now Amina names it as AFC, Amina's fried chicken. So rhythmically also, you know, people are attracted towards that in that sense. So the whole culture of... Uh, eating food and diet in some sense you know largely impacted by the particular technology the tech space that is that you see in the mobile phone so what makes you happy is that you can happy with the mobile phone because you can have a uh, an empty number of you know tasks uh, uh, that you can uh, effectively use with these mobile phones now coming to teaching i have seen that you know teachers are downloading maximum apps perhaps a large number of apps the largest number of apps that are being downloaded are teaching apps in that sense, you know. Teachers are the uh, people who, you know, import a largest number of apps like, you know, sometimes they use the Zoom, sometimes go to the Google Classroom, sometimes Google Talk or Webinar Jam, lot of apps are coming. So for the teacher domain also, they think that, you know, this is an inescapable, you know, uh, uh, gadget in that sense. You cannot escape from this gadget. You cannot escape from this particular space, you know. So teaching in that sense goes online in that sense, you know, and somebody may call it as, you know, teachers online. So everywhere, in every area, the COVID has taught you that the power of technology. I'm not saying that you have not witnessed this particular power of technology earlier or not, not that you are not going to witness this power of technology afterwards. But the thing is that during the post time, technology taught you a lesson. The lesson is that you get impacted, you get intimately connected with the, the technology. Your connection with the technology, the gadget has become inextricable. It cannot be, uh, it cannot be resolved in that sense, you know. You cannot get away from that in that sense. There may be solitary cases, individual cases, you know, where people live like the ancient philosophers without the computers, but that is not the, not the case with the whole of the humanity. Now, I am coming to certain deeper epistemological questions uh, based on my uh, observations in that sense. Now, just for a moment, you look at the doctor. This is not to say about the COVID times, you know. You look at the doctor. So, what? Uh, see, for what we went to the doctor in order to get relief from a particular disease, you know, in order to get cure. So, mechanisms are also there. In earlier times, uh, the doctor used to suggest an x-ray. So you will go to the x-ray mechanism, x-ray technician, you will x-ray your body and go to the doctor with the report. Then there is a development in the medical uh, radiological technologies and you have the CT scan, computer tomography. And now you have a more advanced uh, form of uh, computer tomography using magnetic resonance imaging system that is called the MRI. And then you can ultimately scan a particular disease, its origin and its locale by using a particular chemical dye through a scan which is called a positron emission tomography, that is the PET scan. And your organs uh, uh, can be scanned 
uh, with separate mechanisms for example the breast scanning mechanism breast tomosynthesis uh, uh, in that sense you are a breast can be scanned in order to detect any uh, you know infection with the carcinogenic cells so now what i am saying is that you are going to see a doctor for headache and the doctor is saying that you go and take an x-ray perhaps your belief in the doctor dindison comes down because the doctor did not advise an mri so you consult another doctor who is a very cunning doctor or who is a very tactful doctor who understand uh, your emotion and sensibility that he advises you to take an mri and you take the mri go to him with the report and uh, after seeing the report the same medicine is uh, you know suggested by the doctor with a different uh, uh, what do you call uh, company name in that sense uh, a tablet name so you are uh, very happy with that doctor so what uh, is the chance uh, that you see from this particular kind of your belief in the machines more than the doctor so the medical system is also promoting such a such a thing where the machines are deciding uh, the disease locating the disease and deciding what is this disease and ultimately the machines may also decide that you know uh, the cure is like this so uh, there are people who visualize that in times to come perhaps there there can be robotic doctors in that sense so chances of getting diseases i am going to the doctor for prescription that is legally essential may uh, emerge in future so you yourself can use a particular mechanism inside your uh, room and uh, find out what is your disease and go to the doctor for a treatment that may also come in some sense that you know the doctors themselves are replaced by mechanistic guardians in that sense so your belief in the machine grows your belief in the tech gadget grows whereby the real human are alienated now this leads to a dangerous uh, what you call uh, situation where you can see the integration of the biotechnology and the info technology now the greatest problem and menace that is uh, uh, that the whole humanity is facing is the integration or the merging of the boundaries of biotechnology and info technology biotech and info tech this is a dangerous unionization a famous historian very popular historian these days you know you all know harari he comes up with an equation b into c into d is equal to a h h b stands for biological knowledge c stands for computer power and d stands for data that is equal to a h h a h h means ability to hack humans you can hack the humans these days you know you can hack the brain of a human in that sense and understand the emotion of a person at a particular point of time for example the present surveillance days you know uh, you are um, uh, you have to pass through certain biometric uh, devices for um, measuring or uh, diagnosing your uh, temperature you have to go uh, get it scanned through sev uh, several mechanisms to see that your body is not infected tomorrow this surveillance may tend to be a surveillance of the emotions what are your thinkings uh, inside the brain what do you think about a leader what do you think about a teacher inside a classroom you know so this merging of biotechnology and info technology and largely major corporations are also moving in that sense you know so it has come to a particular situation where the gadget is assuming the role of a gender in that sense some 3 4 years before an american youth filed a case in the federal court his petition was that he wanted to marry a mobile phone and i have read from some of the newspapers that the mobile phone was dressed like the partner since he was a male he wished the mobile phone to dress like a woman and so the mobile phone was dressed like that and it was taken in a car special car and the priest solemnized the, uh, the marriage in that sense it leads to changes in the gender equations you know after all, what is gender in that sense you know a machine can be called uh, as a male or a female or as a gay or a heterosexual in that sense you know leading to changes in the epistems you know the mental apparatus that is changing the the the, the paradigm is changing in that sense uh, where you think that your mobile phone is a friend uh, whom you cannot miss at any time so what is my point is that Uh, technology especially communication technology is an invasive species in that sense 
invasive species like the tea, the tea plant which invaded the landscape of India and made a separate beverage, uh, you know, which was not that familiar with the Indians. We were only growing wild tea. The Europeans planted the tea and it became a usual beverage for you. It desired your taste. So your taste, your emotions, your sensibilities are decided by a particular technology these days. That is the integration of the uh, biotech and infotech, uh, the dangers or the prospects. Both I am saying that this is not bad and that is true. But uh, the, the proposition is that the dangers and prospects come together in the integration of the biotech and the infotech uh, technologies. And now you see, like you go to the restaurants, when you go to a particular airport or railway station, you have charging stations for your mobile phone. So when you go to the restaurant, the mobile phone usually goes to the charging station. So the life is to be maintained in that, in that sense, you know. So this gadgetization of the humans ultimately leads to the humanization of the gadgets. Because the gadgets are expanding the social base tremendously. The gadgets are assuming a particular class distinctiveness or a, a social class distinctiveness uh, because you can see the gadgetization of the social spaces also. This is a uh, this is a, the new normal in that sense. You can understand, you know, what is normal. The new normal in that sense, it becomes a culture, not just a technological gadget. And now you look at the demographic base expansion of uh, these gadgets, you know, it reaches all the social classes irrespective of their uh, status in the society. It reaches the rich and also the poor. So the cyber spaces have opened up a new social spaces whereby the cyber spaces may welcome people, new citizens, new Saudi citizen like the Sophia, the first robot uh, who received the citizenship you know, in that sense. Now I'm going to end my talk with, you know, um, uh, a reference to, with reference to an advertisement which came in the Hindu last day, the previous day. Uh, the advertisement was, you know, actually the, the second page, the full page advertisement of the Hindu is that about a particular disinfectant, uh, which the which the company named as Bacto Five. Bacto Five is a sanitizer that will not harm the gadgets. So gadget receiving the body status of, you know, the body status in that sense, you know, a mobile phone or a laptop or any other gadget which makes you communicate with the people in that sense assumes a particular body. That body is also to be disinfected in that sense. That is what the advertisement states. And in the advertisement it is written, the sanitizers, disinfectants that are used to sanitize the hands of the human may be injurious to the gadgets. So the gadget in that sense assumes a, a more significance, you know, more significance than the human. So people may queue up in the medical shops or, you know, in the supermarkets for, for buying this new gadget disinfectant, which reveals the question that how intimate is the gadget to you in that sense, you know. Suppose, you know, the company, some company is coming with a disinfectant for the chairs you use for uh, the car steering that you use or the tables that you use, you will not buy that because that has not, those devices or structures have not reached the power stage. Only the mobile technologies, the internet technologies and the gadgets have reached the power stage. So it is to cure the gadget. If you want to cure yourself, you have to cure the gadget also. So things have come to such a pose that this single simple advertisement semiotically reveal the humanization of the gadget. So from gadgetization of the humans, you are reaching a stage of humanization of the gadget. Thank you very much. I stop here. Are there any questions? Aisha Saeed has asked, what are the possible modifications and solutions uh, we can try adapting to? What are the possible modifications and solutions we can try adapting to? Aisha Saeed, that is a very intelligent question. I think that is more uh, a moral question uh, in that sense, you know, uh, when you get adapted to the gadgetization, 
you know, you feel that your human is lost and the gadget finally uh, assuming significance, you know. Uh, so, uh, the solution to this problem, uh, we can say of any solution to the problem, but only to the judicious and uh, what you call more humane oriented use of the gadgets in that sense. I am not saying that this is bad in that sense. Uh, this is bad and this is right. That proposition I am not taking. Because uh, the humans are using, humans are uh, attached to these kind of gadgets, especially pertaining to this communication, uh, to an extent uh, which can be considered as a fictional reality in that sense. A fictional reality, not an objective reality, but a fictional reality. Because, you know, uh, people are living in, uh, in, a, in a world where uh, you know, corporations and systems make big stories uh, uh, which are very interesting in the sense, which are very, very charming stories in that sense, you know. So, your belief to understand the stories, uh, I use the stories in, uh, in, in, in inverted commas, in brackets. The stories, uh, you have to understand the genuineness of the stories in that sense, you know. Uh, because the stories are uh, told by certain people, uh, who are uh, certain corporations who are desirous of, you know, expansion of certain uh, what you call interests which are hidden in that sense. Maybe capitalist interests or interests of profit of trade or something like that. That is always there. So my uh, response to your question is that uh, no solution is, uh, uh, is, is there. But you have to decide the borders of gadget and you are human borders. One has to understand where to limit the gadgets and where the human is to say what you call an autonomous sphere of oneself. So it's largely a question of self introspection in that sense. Secondly, uh, what all ethical or moral lessons uh, uh, or instructional values which are added by the governments or the religious institutions or uh, counseling centers or medical centers, right? All of them will be of a lesser significance in that sense because you are living in a new world with a new language. So one has to see this gadgetization as a phenomena and one has to take, you know, certain uh, modifications of the behavior internally in that sense. That is my response to your uh, question. Now, um, uh, uh, Lukmanul Hakim, um, is it possible to make a theoretical proposition regarding film Android Kunyapen from this standpoint? Exact, exactly, you know, because, you know, Android Kunyapen, you know, I was also thinking about this Kunyapen in that sense. Because when his son is away from him, the robot acts, you know, as a real panacea for the, uh, for affecting a tie up with the old man in that sense, you know. So uh, that also leads to consideration because Kunyapen need not be an android in that sense. You know. I am inverting question of Lukman Ul Hakim and saying that uh, we have with us several Kunyapens in that sense because you have the mobile phone which is a Kunyapen for me, right? Because you go to sleep with the Kunyapen, you go to the bathroom with the Kunyapen, uh, you drive and hear the Kunyapen. So everywhere Kunyapans are there, not in the form of these uh, robots in that sense. Nobody, perhaps, you know, uh, cheap and uh, what you call um, less expensive robots may uh, uh, reach the field, reach the firms or shops so that you can buy. So uh, the proposition is that, you know, uh, extreme attachment to the gadgets may uh, seem to be, you know, what you call a suicidal in that sense, you know, and the film ends like that. Uh, but I don't believe in that particular dictum. Because you cannot say that it is a hero villain trajectory uh, that is the android uh, version of a human being uh, in, in the form of a robot is a villain in that sense. No, it is a situation, it is a new language, it is a new culture in that sense, you know. What we are leading to perhaps in the 2050, uh, after 30 years, uh, uh, you may have in the planet earth, on the planet earth, you know, inorganic humans in that sense, not organic humans. So things are going like that. And that is the prophetic state statements made by many cybernetic philosophers and also historians and social theorists. Thank you. Thank you, Lukman, for that question. Um, 
Now, Shabir Mohan has asked, people are largely unaware of the threats they face because of the gadgetization. What's your take on this? People are unaware. No system of schooling. Because you see, uh, you have to have a particular uh, schooling. You have to improve, you have to uh, remodify your uh, curriculum and syllabus with the aim of making people understand this because this has become a new subject and discipline in that sense, you know. Like, you know, quarantine studies which emerged in the post-plague times. In the modern times after the quarantine, you have a particular school which is known as the quarantine times, you know. You can have also, you know, some studies specifically designed for that, like the, uh, the times of the new digital spaces, digital times in that sense, you know. The times of the gadget, you know. So, uh, no amount of counseling, no amount of, you know, uh, persuasion uh, uh, will lead you, uh, uh, will make you people understand, you know, the impact of these gadgets. Because they, that's why I, uh, I answer to Aisha also in that sense, you know, you have to internalize in that sense. Firstly, it's basically an individual introspection of things. And secondly, collectively the institutions, the educational institutions, and other institutions which aim at transformation of the minds of the people can also, you know, come with certain uh, instances, certain ideologies, uh, certain uh, position takings on understanding the gadgets in that sense, you know. So, largely, uh, it is very difficult to stand against the culture, you know. But the use or uh, misuse of the gadgets is basically an individual um, body called terrain or a domain. That's my take on your question. Purnima Rajesh has come with one question. Instead of we domesticating gadgets, gadgets have domesticated us. To a certain extent that is true, but it is after all the decision and um, imagination of the human that decided the gadgets. So when you look at the gadgets disciplining us, you have to look at the deeper layers of the human factor that is behind the gadget that is disciplining us. The gadget is an instrument in that sense. So, the gadgets were disciplining us, but you can't say that it is the unilaterally the gadgets that have disciplined us, but it is the system, the rationality of the system that, uh, you know, uh, was disciplining us in that sense. But the thing is that when you um, attribute these human elements, uh, uh, a cognitive elements in that sense, the power to think and to make differentiation and distinctiveness, the gadgets will start disciplining us. So that is the threat that is coming from the kind of uh, subjugation. It is not a question of disciplining in that sense, but it is a question of subjugation to a particular gadget. How we subjugate ourselves, surrender ourselves to the gadget means we surrender to the Google. We surrender to the Facebook. We surrender to the mobile phone. When we surrender to the mobile phone, it is a surrender to an industry also in that sense. So uh, uh, it is not right to say that, you know, uh, we were uh, domesticating uh, the gadgets. It is not right to say that gadgets were domesticating us, but industries, you know, uh, several other factors behind the gadget were was domesticating us. Uh, I would rather prefer to call it as the uh, rationality of the system in that sense, you know. Thank you, Purnima. What effect the technological transformation will have on education? Will this adversely affect jobs in the educational sector? This is the question which uh, is becoming a very important question these days because uh, the technological transformation of education, if it goes the way, there are the two uh, perspectives on this, uh, Shabir. One is that if the technology goes like uh, saying that, you know, the output is to be decided by certain figures and figurative dimensions like how you can differentiate the history student's output from the engineering student's output is a question. Technologically, when you go and when you take the particular, the mere technological perspective or utilitarian perspective, what happens to us the end is that, you know, the output will be determining the input in that sense, you know. If the output is figuratively not beneficial to the people, figuratively not beneficial to the people, not uh, me mentally or psychologically, when the output is decided in terms of uh, in terms of certain material benefits to the people, that becomes a problematic proposition. So, uh, 
let us look at the outcome based education system that is uh, pro promoted by the higher education scenario these days you know what is the outcome after all uh, whether you have a teacher education that is a physical room education or an online education you will look at the outcome the outcome cannot be decided in terms of utility alone the outcome is to be decided in terms of the uh, social factor uh, the causative factors that make changes in the society that's not just you know making things or innovating things and materials but the mental disposition also I would uh, uh, end up your end up answering to your question by stating that you know you look at the outcome based education for that is followed by the medical board the medical education board now people are arguing that history is to become a subject for uh, medical students literature is to become a subject for medical students why because history humanities and lit letters or literature will definitely lead to more humanization of the medical student in that sense so the uh, technological what you called the uh, technological transformation as effect on education is to be judged from the point of view of not the outcome that is concrete and material but an outcome which cannot be explained by certain figures and certain statistics in that sense thank you shabur sangeeta uh, has asked a lot of ethical issues are to come with us should we prepare ourselves to redefine ethics itself see sangeeta ethics is entirely different um, uh, uh, terrain here because i am going to ask you one question you know in some colleges you know uh, there are special classes and uh, sessions for uh, educating values i am asking this question uh, is there you know any room is there any application what is the outcome of you know teaching values in that sense you know what is the ultimate realization of values so you have to get along with this particular go ahead with this particular technological world because that has become a new paradigm new mental apparatus in that sense you know so uh, something like you know preparing for a war in that sense is not possible that is not what uh, i meant through my lecture but to take a mental disposition and to understand you know what is happening in the world as of now because of these instrumental changes uh, due to the opting uh, due to the criss crossing from one technology to the other so when you evolve an ethics particularly relating to particular technology the next day a new technology emerges in that sense that is that will become a problem so the ethical position taking of an individual is to be decided by the old factors of humanness love empathy cooperation harmony such emotions you know such emotions have to rule the human world but to a greater extent the gadgetization in some sense you know while uh, reinforces these kind of emotions on a larger terrain uh, it is taking these emotions from you uh, because your emotions are also in that sense gadgetized so the ethical formulations or reformulations are not to be judged by the changes in the technology but they are the same because some of the uh, some of the truths which we have come to understand that is humanness you know how can you teach in an, an ethical class you know it is to be internalized in that sense you know so there is no sense of reformulating the ethical uh, you know uh, position taking but ethics uh, and ethical behavioral formalities uh, will be remodulated in a world which is affected by the technologies thank you sankita you mentioned in the beginning that gadgets and instruments represent the triumph of science and its application called technology do you believe that these instruments really contributed to triumph ah, that is again a good question because triumph means what i meant by triumph is a triumph of scientific rationality not that the gadgets and the science is uh, creating an emancipatory world in that sense you know as everyone believed that you know the science and technology was to be more emancipatory then what happened with the what happened with the second world war you know technology improved science uh, manifested its uh, imperial domain what ultimately happened was that you know uh, you look at the the miseries to the people so many deaths and casualties uh, so many people lost their kith and kin so the thing is that it is not that you know uh, the, the triumph of science in that sense but a triumph of scientific rationality in that sense you know 
because now you look you look at the present time and look at the uh, the triumph of science in you know developing a particular vaccine for uh, the covid 19 disease definitely it's a triumph of science in that sense it's a triumph of medical research in that sense that will lead to a reaffirmation of the people in rationalization based on scientific principles that is what i meant by the triumph of science it is not the end product that uh, emancipates you but ultimately it is the notion of science which is explicated which is revealed through the use of a particular gadget so perhaps in future more gadgets in the form of you know uh, sensing gadgets or uh, uh, computer tomographies you know uh, new kind of you know uh, instruments will develop will be developed by a scientist and ultimately designed by the technocrats and it will reach the markets in that sense you know ultimately you can forecast like you forecast the weather you can forecast and foresee the coming of a new virus what is the triumph there it's a triumph is in two ways one is that you can cure the disease because you can foresee the disease now the second thing is that the entire of the humans the human community as a whole comes to understand the importance and significance the infallibility of the science and scientific research that is what i meant by uh, by my argument okay thank you very much for the invite and thank you participants for the patient listening